Hello everyone, this is Alex Rafi again, and welcome to the lecture on endocrine physiology. Let's start by talking about a quintessential endocrine hormone, insulin. When insulin is made, it is first produced as proinsulin. This molecule has three components, the alpha chain, the beta chain, and the C-peptide. Proinsulin is then processed by the Golgi, where the C-peptide molecule is removed, indicated by this arrow here and the alpha and beta chains remain to make up insulin which is released into the bloodstream. The reason why we have to know how insulin is made is because there's an important clinical correlate that you will be tested on. When we make insulin in the body both insulin and C-peptide are eventually released into the bloodstream. However, synthetic insulin, i.e. the pharmaceutical version, does not contain C-peptide. So how could you be tested on this? Well, you're likely to be given a scenario in which a patient presents with symptoms of hypoglycemia, sweating, lightheadedness, nausea, or worse, they may be comatose, and their blood glucose levels will be very low. You are then left with the task of finding out why they became so hypoglycemic. Was it because there was an insulin secreting tumor? Or maybe the patient was secretly injecting themselves with insulin to purposely make their blood sugar levels low. If we were to take the case in which a patient were secretly injecting themselves, what would you expect the C-peptide levels to be? High, low, or normal? In this case, the C-peptide levels should be low, while the insulin levels will be high. Now, how does insulin actually get released from cells? To better understand this process, let's think of what signals your body needs to release insulin. That signal would be increased glucose levels in the blood. Glucose can enter cells via an insulin-independent GLUT transporter, also known as GLUT2. As glucose enters the cells, what happens to it? Well, it is broken down via glycolysis to produce ATP. When ATP is generated, it will open potassium channels. Do you remember what happens when the potassium channels in the membrane close? You will have depolarization. This depolarization leads to the opening of what channels? Calcium. Perfect. And what is the effect of this? Insulin-containing vesicles are released from cells. If it helps you to remember, this is very similar to the mechanism by which neurotransmitters are released from the presynaptic terminals in the neurons. The insulin released into the bloodstream from these cells has a wide variety of effects. Four of these effects are directly related to energy storage. Insulin causes an increase in cellular glucose transport an increase in glycogen synthesis and storage in the liver and muscle, and an increase in triglyceride synthesis and storage. And lastly, it also increases protein synthesis in muscles. I'd like to briefly comment on this first point here, glucose transport. Let's break it down step by step. So first you have insulin binding to a receptor. There are specific tissues that will express insulin receptors and are known as insulin responsive tissues. Do you know what tissues these are? Perfect. Liver, muscles, and adipocytes. Looking back at our list of functions of insulin, we see that it will increase glycogen synthesis and storage, which, if you remember from biochemistry, occurs in the liver and muscles. Meanwhile, you have your adipocytes, or fat cells, that are going to make triglycerides. As a bonus question, do you know what type of receptor the insulin receptor is? It is a protein tyrosine kinase receptor. Now let's go over the biochemical details of what happens after insulin binds to its receptor. This results in the activation of PIP3 or phosphatidylinositol 3 kinase pathway which stimulates the movement of vesicles containing GLUT4 to the plasma membrane. These GLUT4 transporters get embedded in the plasma membrane and then allow for more 
glucose to enter cells. As you can see, if you understand how this process occurs, then you don't have to memorize all the details. Two other things that insulin does that are mentioned in your text include sodium retention by the kidneys and increasing cellular uptake of potassium and amino acids by all cells. Why is it important to remember that insulin shifts potassium into cells? Well, when we administer insulin therapeutically, it can cause large potassium shifts and consequently hypokalemia. This can result in conduction deficits in the heart and lead to arrhythmias. This will be reviewed in your cardiology lectures too. A setting in which we would administer insulin and worry about hypokalemia is when a type 1 diabetic presents in diabetic ketoacidosis. We are going to review this topic later in the endocrine pathology lectures, so keep this in the back of your mind for now. Overall, the human body does its best to try to maintain blood sugar levels. When there is too much glucose in your blood, your body will increase secretion of insulin to lower it. But then, on the other hand, if there is not enough glucose in blood, your body will need a way to turn off secretion of insulin. Do you know what hormones can inhibit the release of insulin? Two of these hormones are released by the pancreas. What are they? Right, glucagon and somatostatin. Somatostatin actually inhibits both glucagon and insulin, and you will learn more about somatostatin in the gastroenterology lectures. Two other hormones that can inhibit the release of insulin are related to stress. Do you recall what they are? Catecholamines and cortisol. Collectively, these hormones are often referred to as counter-regulatory hormones, as they oppose the action of insulin. Here's a way I remember that catecholamines and cortisol inhibit insulin release. If you remember, catecholamines and cortisol are released in times of stress, i.e. when you need to run. You need sugar to fuel your muscles. Therefore, it only makes sense that these hormones would work to keep blood sugar levels high. They do this by stimulating the release of glucagon, which opposes insulin and promotes the release of sugar into the blood, rather than uptake into the cells for storage. There is also a type of adrenergic receptor that when stimulated inhibits insulin secretion. Do you remember which one this is? Right, the alpha-2 receptor. Conversely, there is a type of adrenergic receptor that when stimulated will increase insulin release. Do you remember which one that is? Right, the beta-2 receptor. A way you could be tested on this is that you are presented with a patient who has symptoms of hypoglycemia due to the side effect of a particular medication. You will be given a list of medications that act on adrenergic and muscarinic receptors and you will want to look for your beta-2 agonist drugs. A good example of this would be an asthmatic using significant amounts of albuterol, which is a beta-2 agonist. On the other hand, there is a hormone produced by the anterior pituitary gland which stimulates insulin release. Do you recall which one this is? I'll give you a hint. It's produced by acidophils. Growth hormone. Nice job. You should keep in mind that some cells can take up glucose at any time, regardless of whether or not insulin is present. And this really depends on what subtype of GLUT receptor is expressed on the cell membrane. The first type we'll talk about is the GLUT1 receptor, which is insulin independent, meaning that glucose will be taken up at any time. Do you know what type of cells express these receptors? Good, red blood cells and neurons. Why do you think it is that these cells have a transporter that allows glucose to enter at any time? Well, it is because these cells are highly dependent on glucose to function. RBCs only have the capacity to perform glycolysis, so glucose is their main source of fuel. Now why is it that they cannot perform aerobic respiration? Well, they don't have mitochondria. Glucose is also the preferred energy source for neurons, 
And as the CNS has lots of very important jobs to perform, it needs to have a constant supply of glucose to keep working. The way I remember this is that these cells are number one. There's also a type of glute receptor that is bidirectional. Do you happen to remember what subtype this is? Glute 2. And if you remember that bi means 2, then you'll never forget this subtype. The cells that have this glute 2 receptor are the islet beta cells, the cells in the liver, the kidney, and the small intestine. Cell types that have predominantly GLUT4 receptors require insulin to take up glucose, and these include skeletal muscle and adipocytes. We already mentioned glucagon when we talked about the pancreas. Do you remember what cells produce this hormone? Right, it is made by the alpha cells of the islets of Langerhans in the pancreas. Let's review what this hormone does. The way I remember this is that insulin and glucagon work as opposite hormones. Insulin is our builder that makes glycogen and triglycerides and protein, which is why it is considered an anabolic hormone. Meanwhile, glucagon is a catabolic hormone, or what I like to think of as our destroyer. Glucagon will stimulate glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis in the liver to release glucose into the blood. Remember that it acts on the liver to do this, and although skeletal muscle also has glycogen, interestingly it is broken down in the presence of glucagon. Additionally, glucagon stimulates lipolysis and ketone production. So now that we know what it does, what do you think is a key stimulus for glucagon release? Right, hypoglycemia. Then what do you think inhibits its release? Well, several things, including insulin, hyperglycemia, and somatostatin. Think about what I said. Glucagon works to counter-regulate insulin, and it makes sense that the release of one would inhibit the release of the other. It is also helpful at this point to briefly review the biochemical mechanism of how glucagon functions, as I find that when you hear this multiple times in different contexts, you will remember it better. Remember, boards can set you up with a scenario of a patient presenting with a glucagon secreting tumor and then ask you what is the secondary messenger involved in the signaling pathway of this molecule. As I start to review this in more detail, feel free to pause the video and fill in the next steps of the process and test yourself to see what you remember. We start with glucagon binding to its receptor, which stimulates adenylylcyclase. This leads to increased levels of the second messenger, cyclic AMP, which then activates protein kinase A. The downstream effects of this are to 1. Stimulate hormone-sensitive lipase, which increases lipolysis. 2. Phosphorylate glycogen phosphorylase, which stimulates gluconeogenesis. And 3. PKA phosphorylates acetylcoenzyme A carboxylase, which prevents its conversion from acetyl-CoA to malonyl-CoA, which normally increases fatty acid synthesis. Effectively, this decreases fatty acid synthesis. As a result, we now have acetyl-CoA, which can be available for ketone synthesis. If you do not recall these downstream effects, take a moment to look over your biochemistry notes and see how all this ties together. 